Hi everyone, it's Alex, and today is my May wrap-up. I read 10 books in May, so I feel really good about that, and I read some really good books that I'll list down below. To start things off, I have a poetry collection called Crush by Richard Sykin. This collection won the Yale series of Younger Poets in 2004, and it seems like the speaker in these poems is definitely a gay man, and I think these poems are really nuanced, and I think they're all really in some way about things like shame, guilt, certainly love, but also really I think how um, gay men or just really homosexual relationships are often seen as spectacle. And I think the speaker in these poems, I think what he's trying to do is it's in a way so intimate that even I, where I can relate to this also as a gay man, but I feel like it's so private that I can't really imagine these poems being spoken aloud to an audience at a reading. Instead, I felt this strong reinforcement of internalized emotion, and it gave me a lot of anxiety reading it, but I can only imagine that sort of panic or vulnerability from Richard Sykin as he was writing these. The foreword to this by Louise Gluck also uses that word panic. That word is never really mentioned in this collection, but I think it's a great descriptor for it. I feel like really there's a lot of meditations on here that recur like light, naming, and talking about hands. And I feel like with all those things, those are definitely things that feel out of control to the speaker in these poems. And I feel like often I would describe his behavior here as disassociation to where everything he's describing, he always wishes that since it comes back a lot of these poems talking about the body, he wishes that he almost didn't have one, that it feels weird to be in one. And how that word crush, um, it can mean a lot of things like having a crush on someone, being crushed by the weight of somebody else. And it's just really, it really moved me. A lot of these poems um, had a very profound effect on me. So um, I highly encourage you to pick this one up if you're into poetry. I don't read poetry often, but I really loved this collection. Moving on to short stories, I have Interpreter of Maladies by Jumpa Lahiri. This won the Pulitzer Prize in 2000, and I would say out of all the books I'm talking about today, this is the one I would recommend the most, and the one I think it's probably my favorite of this month. What I really loved about this collection is I think Lahiri does a great job at um, touching on things from her own personal life. I recently read an article that I found um, in the New York Times, I think, or maybe it was the New Yorker, I'll link it down below, where Lahiri does talk about how she was inspired by her parents immigrating to the States. Um, a lot of the stories in here are reflective of that. There's this definite adaptive quality to Lahiri's characters in here um, with themes of like isolation and again adapting to situations, especially with children. I feel like the stories with children in here are really strong because I feel like as children we all have that point where we realize how we adapt to sort of society and what's considered social norms. So often the time the case is in here that the adult characters, they have things going on and then children become a witness to that. For example, a young girl in here um, witnesses a family friend of her parents that lives with them that he's wondering how his home country is doing during war and what she does the girl the child is that she eats these pieces of candy every day as like a ritual to make sure that every day is going to be okay another case in here is a story about a boy who plays a game with this older woman that's like his babysitter and she sort of falls apart um, emotionally because of her personal life and all of these children just become witnesses to this stuff and I think it's really powerful and just the stories in here are really great. In that New Yorker or New York Times article, Lahiri does mention that the first story in here called A Temporary Matter, that was the first story she ever wrote as an adult. And it's just really wonderful. I, I, I know Lahiri has some sort of nonfiction text. Um, sort of memoir, and I'm definitely going to read that soon. I just really love her writing, and I really encourage you to pick up this collection as well. Another short story collection I read is The State We're In by Anne Beattie. Not much to say about this one, other than I didn't really like it that much. The stories in here are definitely charged more with mood rather than plot, and that's completely fine for me, but I don't know. I just feel like some of the stories were literally so short. 
I sometimes didn't even know what was going on. They were just sort of these uh, vignettes of things going on. And I think that's okay if you execute it well. But for me here, it just, I don't think it was given justice. Moving on to kind of nonfiction here, I have A Field Guide to Getting Lost by Rebecca Solnit. I really love this work by Solnit. I really want to read the rest of it. I've always heard about Solnit and I've read some of her essays before around online, but this one in particular about being lost, Solnit kind of opens it up about how as a society, especially in the States maybe, we um, repel from the idea of being lost, whether that's literally um, like on a hike or it's just in our lives, maybe like in our 20s or something like I'm in, where we don't embrace being lost. Solnit kind of instead turns it to where being lost is really empowering and how it's almost inev inevitable that at any time we're bound to be lost. But then even acknowledging that, that sort of inevitability, it becomes another problem where it seems like in a way, like existentially, what's the point of life if we're only bound to be lost indefinitely? And the real triumph in this collection, I think, is whenever Solnit kind of talks more about herself. Solnit, her background is in history, so there are a lot of historical um, things brought up here. That's how she makes sense of the world, and I really love that. She has meditations on the color blue, too, which I think is beautiful. Um, but uh, mainly just historical things. But whenever she cites the history or anecdotes from her own life, such as um, a friend of hers passing away very abruptly and she was supposed to meet her, I think, for coffee, and then she feels lost then about what to do. Also this idea how um, Solnit shares that she likes to write fiction inspired by the movie Vertigo, but she explains why she's so drawn to nonfiction. And I think she does a great job at writing what she feels comfortable in, and it's really compelling to read. Up next, I have Night by Ellie Weisel. I really don't have much to say about this one because um, it's so, um, it's great, but I'm really just haunted by scenes here that I know I'll never forget in my life. Weisel does this thing where he's describing, of course, his experience in the Holocaust along with his father and his family, although it's really only about his father in context. But more importantly, Weisel also describes the actions of the people around him in these camps, and he doesn't try to justify their actions, but he also doesn't try to condone them either. And all of that's to really share, this feels like a work that is really just a matter of documenting history and the horrible things involving the Holocaust from a personal account. There are just um, some quick scenes I want to share that are really embedded in my memory. Weisel talks about one time children being hung and one of them still alive because he was so young and so small that he didn't die quickly. There's a scene in which a lot of camp members are traveling, I think, in a boxcar and some sons are allowing their fathers to die, that way they can live. There are times in which Weisel makes it clear how he's connecting the present and the past as he describes they were often given chances to either flee a camp or they could stay at the rumors of a liberation happening. And often the times where Weisel chose to flee, turns out later he realized that if he had stayed, he would have lived, and it really was true that there was a liberation. Again, this will stay with me, I think, for a very long time, and probably forever, and I really encourage you to read it, I'll, just because Weisel never compares his own traumas to others, and I think that's um, very courteous of him, and I mean, you just can't really describe the Holocaust, I guess, to its fullest, but I just really was moved by this, and I feel like I understand this part of history a lot more. Up next I have Educated by Tara Westover. I have my own video on my channel about this book that I'll save for you to go to that if you'd like. I will say though, after reading this and after making that video, I do like this book a lot more. This memoir recounts Tara Westo Westover's experience living with her family kind of off the grid, but also going to college and becoming very educated to a point where she gets her PhD. For me, really, my only gripe is that I felt sort of a disconnect whenever Westover would talk about her educational achievements, and I just didn't really know where that was coming from so immediately. But for me, the triumph here is how Westover articulates her family and their own choices, and she um, justifies them, and she lets us know that her choices aren't necessarily greater than her family's. 
she just happens to recount them and she admits too that her memory isn't in the best place and I like that she does that. I think that's really good for her to admit that to her readers. So definitely pick this memoir up. I think it's a really good one and feel free to watch that video on my channel too. So moving on to fiction, I have Tin Man by Sarah Winman. I almost forgot the author here just because I read this in one sitting and I really loved it. Thinking of great first chapters in books I've read, in my latest memory I really love the first chapter of Days Without End by Sebastian Barry and now I also can put this to the list where I really love the first chapter of this book where it talks about Ellis's mother in the past I think in the 1950s or maybe it's even 30s and how she goes to some sort of raffle and she buys a painting against her husband's wishes and it's uh, Van Gogh's sunflowers and that painting becomes really significant in the course of this novel because uh, with, you know, artwork, it's very timeless, it lives on forever, and it, artwork will always outlive us. So this is a book about spanning, you know, years between a friend circle, between characters named Annie, Michael, and Ellis. And I really love their friendship. I love how it works. Um, Annie and Ellis end up having their own relationship, but it's no secret as well that Michael and Ellis also have their own form of a romantic relationship. We have Ellis who I would describe uh, for the lack of a better term as more domesticated than Michael. As Ellis we get viewpoints from when he's an adult and he has this sort of creeping loneliness as he's getting older as I'm sure a lot of people who get older do. Ellis has this neighbor who's a lot younger who invites him to like parties and stuff and I love how Winman describes that overwhelming loneliness about being older and how experiences when we're older always have to compare to who we are when we were younger. So the big theme here for me is that youth is an eternal and that's made most clear with our character Michael here as he recounts his life, especially along the AIDS crisis. There's a time in here where Michael visits um, AIDS patients in hospitals and how he gets to know them. And I love those parts of this book. To me, it really depicted that AIDS isn't about suffering. It's a lot about memory and how we realize how much joy there is or how much potential there is for joy in our life. And I just really love this book. I feel like if I were to describe this book in one word, it would be joy. I feel like it's just beautiful. And thinking of the title Tin Man, based on what I know, I think, you know, a Tin Man described here is just a very normal job. Um, and I think, again, it's just finding that joy in the everyday that even if you have a job like a Tin Man, it's okay as long as you find the beauty in your own life and what you live for. So similar to those LGBTQ themes or narratives, I have Maurice by E.M. Forster. So this book in comparison to Tin Man, I feel like it was a lot more uh, political, talking about class separation as well as sort of um, how sexuality sort of evolves in men over time. This follows a character named Maurice, if you couldn't tell by the title, but it also follows a man named Clive, and Maurice and Clive end up in their own uh, relationship over the years. And what I love about this book is that I feel like you could say it's just as much about Clive as it is about Maurice. Although um, this isn't really a spoiler, but Clive does uh, take a different pathway with his sexuality than Maurice does, and I love that Forster doesn't try to shame Clive for his own sexual pathway. This book really uh, links sexuality. It's just a very normal thing with, um, you know, developing a man's own masculinity. And I feel like for Maurice himself, I feel like a lot of that becomes complex just because Maurice's father died sometime while he was very young and how Maurice, his masculin masculinity is challenged because um, there's even a scene in here where Maurice is talking to his neighbor who's a man and he has to kind of berate Maurice because Maurice is treating his mother and his sisters very poorly. I feel like there's this whole other layer where Maurice has this like internalized misogyny against his mother and his sisters only because um, maybe of that teen angst where he feels like he can't express his sexuality even to the point where Maurice um, kind of like becomes a predator to this very young boy that he tries to make a move on. So again, I feel like this book, it really does try to, or it does try to complicate um, a sexual awakening and a sexual experience growing up. It tries to make it very nuanced, um, not only from Maurice, but from Clive, and I really appreciate that. Up next I have 
Conversations with Friends by Sally Rooney. Again, I have my own separate video with my own thoughts on my channel, so you can go look at that. But really quickly, this is just a story about Francis, who has very intellectual friends, and Francis um, identifies herself as a writer, but she also gets into this affair with a man named Nick, and Nick is already married, and Nick is also friends with Francis's friend group, so it's really confusing and dramatic. But um, I found this book surprisingly very subtle, and I really liked that. Um, for me, I, I liked this book uh, probably more than some. I gave it three out of five stars on Goodreads, just because I feel like um, too much of this book for me relies on interpreting it. I feel like it's where I'm such an objective reader sometimes, depending on what I'm reading. In this case, that's what I was doing a lot. But for someone that doesn't extensively close read as much as I do, I feel like, they may find this book um, a bit underwhelming. And I can definitely see where that's coming from. I don't think I'm like on a pedestal where like I'm such an, a, you know, I'm such a close reader that that's why I like this. Um, I think, you know, this has a certain audience and I think it's good for them but I did also agree that this is a bit underwhelming. And last but not least, I have The Female Persuasion by Meg Wallitzer. So I read The Interestings by Meg Wallitzer a couple of years ago, and I thought it was okay. I think there are parts where Meg Wallitzer does this thing where she loves, like it's kind of her trademark, she loves to talk about characters through the span of years and change perspective in her books. So this is a story about a girl named Greer who's entering college and she goes to a lecture by this renowned feminist writer named Faith Frank. And for me, this book, it's very readable, which I think is great. I think a lot of people will like this book for that. But I don't know, just the whole time it felt like as I was reading this, it was all set up all the time. I never felt like it was like one flat line the whole time. And for the first couple, or just like for the first hundred pages, I was like, okay, that's fine. Set up, that's good. Establishing characters and their pathways. But then it just felt like that the whole entire time. I was also completely mystified how Greer is cited as this amazing writer just because people say she is. And I just didn't know where that was coming from. And Greer also has a friend named Z who gets her own backstory here, a good amount of pages worth. And for me, that was my favorite part of this book because I felt like that's where the real theme of this book was coming from. However, Z's storyline, technically it doesn't really, I felt like it wasn't really like along with the point of this book. Like I feel like it could easily be taken out. I like that it's in here because for me, Z's story, it shows, even with the title here, Female Persuasion, for me, this is when it clicked that I feel like this book is all about what does it mean to have a legacy and what does it mean to have success? Greer has this big hostility towards her parents about how they didn't fill out the financial financial aid information correctly for Yale that she got ac accepted into. So Greer ends up going to this college that's definitely not up to the standard of Yale and she resents her parents for it. So the whole time Greer is kind of sort of gauging herself where success comes from and she really thinks a part of that is being able to work for Faith Frank herself in a business. But even thinking of Faith Frank, she has this text that she created or wrote called The Female Persuasion and it really took off and ever since then we get to know that Faith had her own magazine business or publishing business called Bloomer but then it turns out it folds and that just means that it no longer exists. So all these characters, um, even Corey, um, Greer's boyfriend, he ends up going to Manila, which is in the Philippines, which I think is really cool because that's where my mom's from. And for me, this also really sealed the deal with themes because in you know places like the Philippines, they're a much more collectivist society. So they see it as like um, everyone helping each other out and things like that. But of course, in the States where all these characters are from, it's much more individualistic and success is really important. So I really love that I think Walitzer is talking about not only feminism, which I think is good, but also the idea that our success is subjective and it's really up to us what it means to live a meaningful life. And I feel like out of the characters in here that Z is the one that finds the most meaning. And I also think she's the one that doesn't initially get um, what she hopes for, but it turns out that everything's okay. That being said, female persuasion, some of the writing tropes in here are a bit cliche for me, or just some character, there's just like this one thing that happens to a certain character, and I just thought it was really dumb. 
And also, if I have to read the word touche between two characters who are flirting with each other one more time, I don't know what I'm going to do. So that is all that I read for May. Ten books. Um, I feel really good about them. I really hope I have just as much luck with good books in June. Please feel free to let me know what you read this month. I would love to know. And um, also, recently I reached 300 subscribers. And um, I know to some that may not be a big deal. But ever since I started this channel, I really only thought I would maybe get like 20 subscribers. Because for me, I think that's a great number just because... I imagine it like that's how many people would be in a classroom. So I feel like I'm just lecturing to a classroom. And I know I say it at the end of every video, but really thank you so much for watching. And as always, I'll see you next time.